Good morning and welcome back to the Money Advantage podcast. I'm your one of your hosts, Rachel Marshall. I've got Bruce Weiner with me today. And Mike Michalowicz is back on the show for a second round with us. Mike, welcome to the show today. It is great to be back, Rachel. And Bruce, thank you for both for having me. Great, Mike. We're glad you're here. Um, you know, we, we've really been trying to focus on bringing uh, top-notch people onto the show. And, uh, you know, you're training a Barb Stackhouse, who we've, we've gotten to know really, really well. And she's been on the show. And I think it's, it's that kind of... Uh, value that most business owners really, really need in today's uh, environment. Well, yeah, thank you for the invite back. And uh, Rachel and I were talking off air about Barb Stackhouse and Drew Heinrichs, who she wrote this new book with, Profit First for Dentists. And she's really embraced the kind of core concept of Profit First and amplified it so well for that community, for the dental community. It's uh, it's really extraordinary to see her journey and Drew's. Mm-hmm. That is awesome. Well, you know, Mike, I just really appreciate the work that you do. And I'm sure that you have, um, you, you definitely have a raving fan in me and us in the community here at the money advantage. And I know you do in many entrepreneurial circles all across the U S and you know, that's very well founded. You've written many books, you've developed multiple businesses. Um, and I think right now you're leading two new multimillion dollar ventures. You've spoken all over the place we're going to put your bio officially in the show notes, but can you just tell us a little bit about the work that you're doing right now for our audience that maybe isn't as familiar with you? Well, hopefully the work that will be happening right now is right over here. Uh, that's a hole in my wall, my home office. That's why I'm home today because my contractor's coming over so we can get this thing done. Nice. Hopefully that's the work. But uh, all kidding aside, what I'm working on now is actually a couple of things. Uh, one is, is I'm, I'm, preparing to launch my newest book. I should also show this off air. This is the manuscript I've completed and, and this is called the second pass of it uh, that I've reviewed and am submitting. What I did was I was, what I do and what I did was I reached out to my community of readers and said, what's the biggest challenge you're facing now? These are people that have read maybe Profit First or Clockwork. I just launched a new book called Fix This Next. It helps you identify what to fix in your business in a sequence so that your business moves forward permanently. And the feedback was my business is growing, but now I'm back to the kind of the core problem is I can handle more lead flow. I just don't have consistent quality lead flow. So mm. this book is about getting back to the basics. And what I found, it's actually fascinating. If you, and you can Google this, type in best practices, best marketing practices and in your industry. So best marketing practices for authors, what I would type in. And what's interesting is you'll, you'll find, you know, the top three or five or 10 things. And those are the exact things I find that are the, what you should not be doing because the best practices while effective have become what's called habituated, meaning they're so common that from the prospect's perspective, it's like, Oh, I've seen this before. Mm. An example and Rachel and Bruce, it's happened to both of you. It happened to me. Do you, Remember, I mean, not the day, but do you vaguely remember getting that first email that said, hey, friend? Um, oh, I yeah. I, right? Uh-huh. I do. I, I can't remember how many years ago, but the first email caught my attention. It's like, hey, friend. And I'm like, oh, I have a friend that calls me friend? Like, which friend is this mystery friend? I'm so excited. Someone, it's a blast from the past. And then yeah. I read through it. I'm like, oh, this is just marketing. Mm-hmm. This, the second hey, friend that came through, then I was cautious. I was like, Hey friend, I'm like, is this a friend or a marketer? And by the third one, I've never read a Hey Friend email again. That points to the power of habituation, meaning when we, the prospect, see something, we very quickly learn to qualify as irrelevant or relevant. And Hey Friend is irrelevant. Mm -hmm. What I researched is how to break through that habituation. Best practices are the Hey Friends of the world. We have to do something that's different and unique that pierces that veil, gets the prospect's attention, compels the prospect, meaning it speaks to them and directs them to take an action. So that that's my newest work that I'm working on right now. I love it. I love it. And I think what's really interesting is that you help entrepreneurs. I mean, you've gone all the way from toilet paper entrepreneur. I, I found you when you had written profit first and really we've had you on the show before where we talked about this whole idea of you can be profitable starting day one in your business. Don't yeah. wait till you are making $5 million to take profit. You didn't go into business to be broke as the business owner. You need to be able to reward yourself and have a functional business. And so that model is something that we use with our clients. We believe in wholeheartedly because 
you have to focus on profit and way too many people are just focusing on the revenue game, which is almost a mirage. I mean, you can have as much revenue as you want. And if you're not profitable, it's nothing, right? Yeah. Yeah. And I want to add to that. I'd say it's more than just a mirage. It can actually damage a business. And we would never think that. There, and sadly, there's quite a few pundits that say sales cures everything. Just sell your way out of it. You just need that one big client. And we believe it. But here's why it can become actually damaging. Every time, Rachel, Bruce, you sell something, you now have a responsibility to deliver on what you sold, that product or service. So the more we sell, the more responsibility we have. And small business owners, that's more and more weight on our shoulders. It starts to show the cracks in the foundation. We don't have the deliverable systems in place. The sales aren't profitable. So we're putting more burden on the organization without extracting health. Many businesses focus on sales prematurely. They should be focusing on profit. Sales are necessary. Like, I'm not saying don't sell at all, but if you have some degree of active sales, we have to have a profit system in place to make sure the business is gaining runway. Then once we have a profit system in place, yeah, let's bolster more sales. And then maybe we jump over and build efficiency. Now, I, I realize all those elements have to be working at some capacity, but only one element can get our full undivided attention at a time. And so most businesses focus their undivided attention on getting more sales to the direct compromise of profitability. So Mike, how, how um, because this comes down to a lot of mindset, I think, because yeah. we have, we have been kind of programmed to sell, 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 and revenue is going to cure everything like you already said, but there, it requires a shift. I think of mindset to say, Hey, no, we need to be looking at, not only how our operations are, but also to, like uh, Barb has, has showed us, how to, how to incent, you know, the people that are in your business to actually look at profit and not just, and not just revenue. C correct. So how does the mindset and what do you do to help uh, business owners with the mindset shift? Yeah. Well, to your point, Bruce, it starts with us. It starts with the owner. And the reason I think our colleagues aren't concerned about profitability, because we're really not concerned about profitability. We, we say we are, but we ignore it. And it's our actions that speak louder than our words. Here's the mindset shift. Um, and I'm actually writing about this now because it's such a simple but powerful method. Most entrepreneurs and business owners like us call ourselves entrepreneurs and business owners. I believe those words have become bastardized. An entrepreneur is about hustle and grind. How bad do you want it? Workaholism. And I think that's a horrible thing to put out in the market. I think what we are about is we're the creator of jobs. Our job is to create a business that actually provides for people who want jobs. Well, the way to make this mindset shift is to frame with a different word. I suggest we use the word shareholder. And here's how you do mm -hmm. it. Next time you're out uh, and someone says, what do you do? Don't say I'm a, I own a small business or I'm a entrepreneur. Say I'm a shareholder of a small business. And it is awkward. You're going to be like, um, I can't believe I just said this. And the person's going to say to you, what does that mean? You're like, some weirdo guy made me say this on a Facebook live broadcast. But here's the deal. If you think about owning shares in a large company, I own some stock in Ford. Here's what I do in my involvement in Ford. I collect the profit because I've taken risk. I've invested with the intention of the valuation going up, but it could decline. So they send me profit quarterly as a distribution. Secondly, I render influence by voting for the direction of the company. I get votes in all the time. Like, hey, we're thinking about making this board of directors. Do you vote for it? We're thinking about adding this new vehicle. What's your vote? And so every shareholder gives strategic direction to the company. A shareholder gives strategic direction and collects the profit for taking on extraordinary risk. That's what we are of our small business. We're a shareholder. We collect the profit for taking the risk and we give strategic direction. We vote for who leads the company and what people do. Now, I realize this isn't like an overnight transition. You still have to do some work in the business, but we must move toward that shareholder responsibility. It starts off with that declaration. Start telling everyone, including yourself, you're a shareholder. And one day you're actually going to believe it and act consistently with it. And that's when everything changes. That's just fascinating. And I think there's so many nuggets packed in here. And I, if you're listening, I hope you won't be spinning in a whirlwind because there is so much here. And I hope <laughs> to um, bring you into this idea of 
reading these books because they are really profound. So let's jump from that idea of being a shareholder, jump over into the pumpkin plan. And <laughs> I've, I've read this book. It was fascinating. It has really been the undercurrent for a lot of the change that we're bringing in the money advantage as well, but explain what it means when you say growing a business is like growing a giant pumpkin. And really, yeah. what does that mean? Really? This was like one of my favorite books to write uh, and to research. And what I found is there's this concept called biomimicry. Biomimicry is where we take something that mother nature has figured out and we translate it to a business or personal application. And the lesson here is mother nature spent hundreds of millions or billions of years figuring stuff out. She probably has a good answer to stuff. So what can we borrow from her? What lessons? Well, I found when it comes to plants that grow, certain plants with some human intervention in particular can have explosive organic and healthy growth. And so what I studied was this concept of colossal pumpkin farming. They change a few things. And with the benefit of mother nature, these pumpkins grow to the size of like a, a car or like a small house. It's unbelievable. And you've seen these in your local newspaper, some farmer leaning against their pumpkin. Well, I looked at the process and actually spent time with colossal pumpkin farmers, which between me and you, they call themselves the Lords of the Gourds. Really? Just sit on that <laughs> one for a little bit. But, uh, but uh, oh what's fascinating goodness. is there's certain steps we can apply to our business. For example, to grow colossal pumpkin, you match the seed to the soil. This is the same idea as matching the concept of your business to the community that wants it. There's a lot of talk about pivoting, and I, I would argue that's a huge mistake. Pivoting is offer something to the community. If they don't like it, keep changing what you're doing until they like it. The problem with that is we may not like it. I've seen people pivot into businesses that they loathe. Yeah, it makes some money, but they hate what they're doing. Instead, we need to do alignment. And that's what these colossal pumpkin farmers do. They match what we desire, our heart calls out some things to do to a community that wants it. That's the seed matching the soil. Now you've positioned yourself for colossal growth. There's another element, and there, there's quite a few in the pumpkin plan, but one more I think of, of extraordinary significance is this concept of pruning, the Lords of the Gourds call it killing. But what, what they do is as a pumpkin starts to get traction and grow very quickly, they are maniacal about removing the other pumpkins from the vine. Now, in business, what I saw as, as a business starts to grow, entrepreneurs often see these other things and try to grow them too. We call them opportunities. Like, oh, mm. there's an opportunity here. Oh, there's an opportunity there. And what it causes is dilution. Now our energy is diverted to multiple things and nothing will grow colossally. What we have to do is actually kill things. And um, just as a little kind of illustration of this, one of the interviews of Steve Jobs uh, before he passed away, uh, the interviewer asked him, what do you attribute your success to? And to give you context, he grew Apple not once, but twice, right? He was removed, came back, grew it again. He grew next computers to $100 million in revenue before it fell apart. I, I want that failure myself, $100 million. He, he grew Pixar. How does he do over and over? And he said, in my final assessment, it's been my discipline of saying no to some of the greatest opportunities in the world. That is the lesson here. We have mm -hmm. to become masterful at one thing, not generalist at multiple. Oh, that's so, so good. And honestly, I think that is a lesson we all can learn over and over and over again, because even yep. when we learn it once, we realize that, oh, now we're in this new area that might have more opportunities and we have shiny object syndrome. And all of a sudden we realize that we're diluting our efforts again, which is just so, so important to steer away from that and focus, focus, focus. And honestly, every person we talk to that's in a space of massive investment success also focuses instead of diversifying. So you hear the, the idea, hey, diversify so that if something fails that you'll have something that wins as well financially. And really the successful are not doing that. They're saying, where do I have the most control and the most um, knowledge in this space? And how can I really focus my, uh, my investing efforts in that specific area so that I can have the massive growth. It's very parallel concept. Yeah, that's, that's right, Rachel. And uh, I will tell you this, that business owners uh, can also see it from a perspective as a, as a customer. So let me just give an illustration from the other side. Uh, imagine you had some horrible disease and, and I wish that upon no one. I'm just saying, just to give it the, the, the significance here. Say you had a brain tumor or something. What are you going to do? You're going to seek out the world's best doctor on removing mm -hmm. that specific disease. And when she comes to you, that doctor and says, yes, I specialize in brain tumors. And then says, you know what? I actually don't just do brain tumors. I'm also a pediatrician. I do heart surgery. 
I'm actually looking at learning stuff, you know, about uh, the, uh, the, the, the entrails of humans or whatever. All of a sudden, she starts diluting her ability. Do you want someone to say, I do brain surgery, you know, once every couple months? Or do you want that brain surgeon that says, this is all I do. Every single day, I wake up, I do this exact process, I've achieved masterful levels, I know exactly what's going on and can anticipate stuff. Of course, option two is what we want. Someone's mastered it, not someone who's diluted. Now you can kind of see it from the prospect's mindset. Understand that's exactly how prospects see you. The prospects who see your solution as life-saving or business altering are going to seek out the best. There is a community that says, oh, I just need X. I just need a cheapo website. They are looking for a commodity. Do you mm -hmm. want to sell those? Those are the, they're looking for the generalists who also do the business cards and all that stuff. But there's a faction in every community that says, I want the best website. This means that my business will stand out and be unique. This is critical to my marketing mission. They're going to seek out the specialist. You know, and that's where you say that if you have the top clients, you, you focus on the sweet spot in yeah. that specific book. And you had this marrying of your top clients married with what you love to do and what you're great at. And then also being able to systematize that. Yes. That I thought was just one of the most profound ideas because we can't systematize something that we're a generalist in all these different areas and you cannot grow a giant business if you're generalizing either. So can you just speak to that for a second? Yeah, so the sweet spot, it's a, it's a Venn diagram. Um, so there's three th intersecting circles. And oh, there you have it right there. And uh, sadly, most businesses pursue only two. So I'll give you the scenarios of, of the two and, and why it's so problematic. Some businesses try to distinguish themselves, be unique, and pursue top clients with that service, but they don't systematize it. The mm. trap there is called TFM, time for money. The only way to grow that business is through more effort because it's not systematized. And that means there's an inherent ceiling. You can't grow beyond your own effort. And that's the most common trap you see where business owners are like, I'm working 15 hours a day. I'm exhausted. I don't even see my family and I can't grow anymore. It's because you haven't introduced systems. Now, another scenario is you have clients demanding this offering and you do have it systematized, but it's not unique or distinct. You aren't the world's best at it. That causes what's called D. PP or downward price pressure because you're seen as a commodity. Mm -hmm. If people want it and you can do it on automatic, but it's not unique, that means anyone else can do it. And that's when the customer comes to you and says, hey, can you sharpen the pencil? Uh, you know, can you cut the price a little bit? That means they don't see you as distinct. You're exchangeable. And that's a problem. Mm -hmm. the, the third scenario, hopefully no one's experiencing this, is you are unique. You have it systematized, but there's no demand. <laughs> uh, there's no acronym. It's just screwed. You're freaking screwed. <laughs> In that scenario, you, you yeah. have to be unique, meaning distinct in the market, irreplaceable. You have to have top client demand, meaning clients that see your offering as uh, more than just significant, it will alter their business for the better, it will alter their lives for the better. That means it's important and critical to them. And the last thing is it needs to be happening on automatic. If, if you can deliver, I'm sorry, attract these prospects, deliver your offering to them, have them raving about the experience and paying you great money all while you're sleeping, you've achieved systemization. And that's truly being a shareholder. That's it. That's being the shareholder. Yeah. Go ahead, Bruce. And, and, oh, and okay. listen, I, I get, you can see I'm kind of soapboxing right now. I get so excited about this is we need more shareholders. We don't need more people to do work. In fact, more people are looking for work, quality work. And, and, there's a strange mm, a state of point. affairs going on right now with this COVID situation. And some people, because of the unemployment situation, are saying, you know, it's better not to work than work that crappy job. I'd rather just not work. I'll, I'll do better for myself. Our job is to elevate the quality of jobs. The number one job of business owners is to be creators of jobs. 7% of the world population is here is us, will ever start a business or operate a business. 93% of the world population is looking for a good job. If you and I are doing the work, we are stealing jobs because it's our job to create jobs, not to do the work or take the work from other people. I think that is really important. I hope that sinks in to anyone listening. That's hitting me right between the eyes. Go ahead, Bruce. Mike, um, I had a really good transition and now I forgot it. Exactly, I got so but, jacked up. I ruined yeah, it. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> okay. But, but uh, here, here's the, here's the thing that I, I see out there that um, the internet provides so much information um, that people are getting caught the trying to provide that information in an educational way, but the educational way is causing people <clears throat> not to, to absorb the education, but not take action. 
So yeah. they're so the, really what they're looking for in a, is a, an advisor, but then some people loathe an advisor telling them what to do yeah. in that situation. And frankly, I think, you know, you really need to become your best advisor personally. So how do you balance a business owner? How does a business owner balance the educational p- portion with this is what you should do, the advisor portion? Yeah, I, I like that question. It, it reminds me very much of the shiny objects syndrome or SOS. And um, I was actually doing a study around this. I'm really into behavioral psychology because the application is 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 myriad. And what was fascinating is taking on a new idea or understanding a new idea, there is a dopamine release and it's very easy. Kind of that in the shower moment, like, oh, I could do this. It feels amazing. We feel like we're 99% of the way there. It's just doing it now. But honestly, we're not even 1% of the way there because the just doing it mm-hmm. part is the brutally hard part. Therefore, it's easier and more satisfying just to create more ideas. And that, that's what knowledge acquisition is like. It's like, oh, I know something new. Oh, I could also do this. And there's this joy in the very surface level stuff, but there's no momentum. So first of all, if we're cognitively aware of it, as opposed to a subconscious response, but consciously aware of this, we can actually see through the effort stage. Now, the other part too, is we can still give ourselves that joy. And it's important. You know, effort without return is very hard to consistently do that because you don't see return. It's what's called delayed gratification. So how do we give ourselves ongoing gratification? And what it is, is simply curiosity. If when you start doing something, if you can get more and more curious about the activity and dig deeper into it, you'll become more masterful at it. And if you look at any expert at anything, uh, Eddie Van Halen on guitar, Eddie Van Halen was so curious about getting to the next level, he got better and better at it. Uh, If you look at any business owner that is dominant in their space, it's because they're wickedly curious about getting better and better at it. So redirect that curiosity, not to something new, but something deeper, and you'll actually execute it. I love it. Okay. So we have about three minutes left here. Um, Go find Mike Michalowicz. I know you can go to mikemichalowicz.com. You can share all of that. Um, do you want to share anything else about your book? I, I also was seeing uh, the new book coming out, the Get Different. You were mentioning the unique offering that you need to grow a business that's really a, a giant pumpkin. And in that sweet spot, does that relate to Get Different? Can you tell us one thing about Get Different that makes us want to get that when it comes out? I believe. Sure, sure. So uh, I'll give you a shortcut because Michalow, it's no one can spell it. You can go to Mike Motorbike. It rhymes. Nickname from grade school. <laughs> Never driven a motorcycle. MikeMotorbike.com. I'll get you to my awesome. website. And there's actually a lesson in there I read about in Get Different is mnemonic memory is most powerful memory. Rhymes, pictorial Hopefully you can picture me riding a motorcycle. It's easy to remember that spelling McCallowitz is very hard. So go to MikeMotorbike.com. I think one of the greatest takeaways you'll get from Get Different, which it's available now on Amazon for pre-order, is there is a flaw I found in marketing plans. There's no question we need a marketing plan. The problem is we often arbitrarily just plan to do things. Everyone else is doing Facebook ads. I should do Facebook ads. That's my plan. Well, it's actually the first few milliseconds of the interaction or experience that prospect has with you that defines the outcome. So get different is about what I call millisecond marketing right now. If you, if we all blink as fast as we can, like the fastest blink you've ever done, that's how you do it. That takes longer than it does to process the consideration of continuing with a piece of advertising or not. It happens in about one tenth of a second. A blink takes longer than that. So therefore, what happens that one-tenth of a second? Well, there's a simple framework. I explain it in Get Different called DAD, another acronym, mnemonic, easy to remember. D stands for you must differentiate. Don't do best practices. Do the unexpected. The unexpected inherently triggers the prospect to evaluate what they're looking at. They have to stick with it longer. That snake or something squiggles in the grass, you have to evaluate that and jump back to see what it is. It's just a human response. Then you must A, attract. Attract means, are you speaking to what the customer wants? That brings them and compels them to continue on with your marketing. The final thing is it must direct. What do you want them to do? And here's the key to direction. It must be reasonable and safe. I can't, if I'm selling a car, I can't tell someone that calls up, hey, I'm considering a car saying, oh, good, send me $100,000. We'll find it for you. They're like, no, no, that's not, who are you? I can say, give me your phone number and I can go through our inventory and list things out. The first direct is give me your phone number, reasonable and safe. So here's a real simple 
mnemonic acronym to remember, and it sounds a little bit gross actually, but any marketing you look at, you say, does dad approve? There's a little bit of a creep factor there, but does dad approve? Does it differentiate? Does it attract? Does it direct? And if the marketing you're looking at fails any of those components, it won't be successful. Wow. That is awesome. You have packed in so much today. Thank you for spending 30 minutes with us. I hope that your tongue is going to be able to relax from all that fast talking um, in the next few minutes here. So thank you. If you are listening today, you have questions, please go over to mikemotorbike.com. Um, you can get all of Mike's books. You can find out his book for pre-order. I'm about to get that myself, get different. And thank you for being with us on the show today and continue building a life and business you love. We'll see you next time.